Hi, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Who has big dreams in life and would like to accomplish all kinds of cool stuff? Awesome. A lot of people talk about living the dream and achieving their dreams, and guess what? Your nighttime dreams can actually help you do that. A lot of people think to themselves, well, I don't actually have any nighttime dreams. I'm a dreamless person. That's actually not true. You don't remember your dreams, but every night you're dreaming. As a matter of fact, you're dreaming probably more than two hours every single night, even if you wake up every morning and never remember your dreams. But I'm a hypnotist. And so the good news is that when we integrate dream analysis with hypnosis, we find all kinds of practical values for hypnosis, including dream recollection. So in today's workshop, I'm going to share with you a lot of different strategies and a lot of different ideas that will help you look at dreams differently and to use dreams in your own life differently and hopefully begin to use this with some of your clients. And dream analysis is a tool for recalling your dreams is absolutely amazing. The simplest way to do this is before you even go to sleep at night, simply set the intention, tonight I will become aware of my dreams. Tonight I will have vivid dreams. Tonight, I will remember my dreams. We can do that in a state of self-hypnosis or meditation or contemplative reflection. Somebody once asked me, what's the difference between meditation and hypnosis? And I know I hear a lot of people, especially at hypnosis conventions, trying to decide what that difference is. It's all the same thing, if you ask me. I don't make a bit of difference uh, between whatever language we want to use to describe these things. And so these processes of self-hypnosis and meditation can actually set us up to dream and I can even wake up in the morning and I can give myself an affirmation even if I don't even remember the dreams, which is last night I was dreaming, today I can recall my dreams. And you might not remember all of your dreams in vivid detail like a Hollywood movie the moment you get out of bed. But as the day unfolds, when we set that intention, when we, when we, when we, when we set our mind to recalling our dreams, we'll find bits and pieces and fragments. And then self-hypnosis and meditation to help us quiet the mind so we can set aside the regrets of yesterday and the worries about tomorrow can actually set us up to be more aware of the dreams that we've had. So self-hypnosis is a great tool right at the outset, especially when people tell me, hey, I don't remember my dreams or I don't have dreams. Dreams are important. And this is the most amazing thing about uh, the field of hypnotherapy. Our expertise is, of course, sleep. We know that hypnos comes from the Greek god Hypnos, right? Uh, the, the goddess of sleep. Uh, she had a wing outside of her head and, uh, and uh, uh, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, there's, I'm not an expert on, on Greek mythology, but, but uh, the, the goddess of sleep, Hypnos, actually, actually it, it was like a brother or a cousin who was actually who is actually the god of dreams. And so we see this relationship historically, and yet I've never been to a hypnosis convention yet where anyone's ever talked about dream analysis. And I, as I mentioned earlier this morning, got lucky. I was randomly assigned a practicum supervisor when I was doing my master's degree in counseling. His name was Dr. Dean P. Montgomery. I thought he was so old and wise. I was 22, turns out he was 28. <laughs> he just graduated with his PhD. He was the new guy, so they gave him the dumb student. And, and, and he, said, he said to me, he said, well, he said, I suppose they didn't teach you anything about hypnosis. And I said, nothing. And he said, well, I'm going to have to teach you. Did they teach you anything about Carl Jung, about dream analysis, about uh, the shadow self? And I said, well, they kind of mentioned it. So that's what I thought. He said, so if you're going to see my patients, practicum, he said, you're going to have to do it my way. We're going to spend the next week learning what they didn't teach you in graduate school. I was the luckiest guy in the world. By the way, Dean Montgomery just retired last year, and uh, we're still good friends. So every now and then you might even see him pop up on Facebook. Maybe I should get him to come speak at an ICBCH convention now that he's retired. Uh, maybe he'll find the time to come. Really interesting guy. But I'm grateful for the gifts that he gave me. He wrote his dissertation on subliminal, subliminal psychology. Uh, very interested in the unconscious mind and hypnosis and dream analysis. And that's where I got my interest. Uh, up to that point, I was probably like most people. I never paid attention to my dreams. Sometimes I had a dream. I thought to myself, that's weird. That's random. But guess what? We actually can note up here, dreams are not random. 
dreams actually come from somewhere inside of us that has purpose and meaning and content and awareness. You see, the person in the dream that you're dreaming about is actually you in the dream. Almost all of the dreams that we have, not all of them, but almost all of the dreams that we have, how many of you are familiar with NLP, studied NLP at all? Lots of people in this room. Is from a first perceptual position. What that means is the me as me, as I dream about me, is in fact me. And that sentence actually makes sense. You can watch the video later and be like, did that really make sense? But the dream that I dream about me, as I dream about me, is the me that is dreaming about me. You are dreaming from a first person perceptual position, which means you are the you in the dream. Once you recognize that, that becomes very powerful because it's not about you, it's who you are. Dreams are deep. Dreams have historical significance. Anyone here ever study historical literature? Anyone here ever study Hebrew literature? Anyone ever study the Bible? Anyone, anyone read the story of Joseph? Right? And, and, and so interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, we see that dreams are an important part in the founding of psychology. So in psychology, those of you who are from a psychology background, you'll recognize this. If you haven't really studied psychology, you may know some of this. But there are considered five pillars of psychology. And the first is a psychodynamic approach. That's Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. They started out as frenemies, and they ended up as enemies, but the reality, they were on the same page. Okay? And, and, and so that's psychoanalysis. And Sigmund Freud wrote his book on dreams in about 1898, and he wrote huge volumes of, 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 dream, of, of things about dreams and about his patients and the dreams that they have. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Carl Jung came along and he wrote his theory of dreams and wrote hundreds and hundreds of pages and cases. And ca Anyone have that big giant book of Carl Jung's? You know, I'm talking about this giant mammoth book. Well, I can't remember the title of it with all these pictures and everything. It's a huge, huge major work filled with information about dreams. And this, by the way, before Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, the queen of the social sciences was a theology degree. Carl Jung's uh, and, and Sigmund Freud's contribution, by the way, it wasn't necessarily that they were correct, although it's interesting, many of Freud's ideas have been recently proven correct in various ways that we can now study the brain and how things work. But, but Freud's contribution was he organized psychology into an academic discipline that didn't exist until 120 years ago. And so, no matter what you think about Freud, oh, he was a cokehead, hey, it was a different time and it was different coke. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but, but the reality is, the reality is none of us would be here without that contribution. None of us would be here without that contribution. Some of you hypnotists are saying, yeah, but I don't do Freudian stuff for Gresta cause. That's straight out of Sigmund Freud. So most of us are here in one way or another because of that psychodynamic approach. Uh, the next approach, though, B.F. Skinner, behavioralism. And uh, although B.F. Skinner and behavioralism didn't write about dreams, many of Skinner's students did because they looked at dreams and said, if, if we're a biological machine and the machine creates the behavior, why is it everybody dreams? And so it took a biological approach to dream function which then looks at dream analysis, and that's pretty interesting from a behavioral perspective. And have you ever made fun of therapists because they say this? So you said the feelings that you feel when you felt the feelings that you feel? Right, reflecting back what you thought you heard the client say, Carl Rogers, the humanistic approaches to psychology, our third branch or third pillar of psychology, and humanistic approaches lend themselves to dream analysis work very, very well. By the way, anyone here ever study cognitive behavioral therapy, the fourth pillar, the fourth branch, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy. If you go see a therapist today, chances are pretty good that your insurance company is going to mandate an evidence-based approach and that your therapist is going to be a cognitive behavioral therapist. That's the predominant approach in just about every, uh, every area of mental health counseling at the current time. Psychology, social work, you know, mental health counseling, you know, the VA, PTSD, depression, whatever. And, and the most interesting thing about this is that Albert Ellis and Aaron Beck, who created cognitive behavioral therapy, 
what people don't realize in Albert Ellis' book, Rationally Motive Behavioral Therapy, he wrote an entire chapter on how hypnosis makes countering cognitive errors more effective. He was a hypnotist, a master hypnotist. He wrote another chapter in that book about the importance of dreams. And here's the most amazing thing about cognitive behavioral therapy. Albert Ellis and Aaron Beck developed cognitive behavioral therapy out of their research in dream analysis. Where does that source come from? From the Albert Ellis Institute itself. Fascinating stuff. So even in our fourth pillar of cognitive behavioral therapy, the most predominantly used approach in therapy today, we find that dream analysis was the foundation of its development. Because a third of the time in life, we're asleep. And for a large majority of that time, we're actually dreaming. And many people think we're only dreaming in the REM stages, and that's simply not true. We're actually dreaming in every stage of sleep. It is true that the REM stages tend to be the most vivid, the most ornate, the most creative, uh, the most interesting. But even in the earliest stages of sleep, our dreams are represented by ideas and thoughts and memories, even of the mundane things of the day. And sometimes people think that the study of dreams is so fascinating because this happens at night. And people are amazed that I wake up in the morning after having this vivid dream, but I can't remember it. And it's my philosophy that this isn't surprising at all. That the night dreams we have really aren't any different than the daydreams we have. And how many of you can relate to this? I need to buy some soap. Who uses soap? Anyone here use soap? <laughs> <laughs> want to make sure my example applies to the majority of people. So I need to buy some soap. I'm out of soap. So I'm going to go to the grocery store and I'm going to go buy some soap. And you go to the grocery store and you see some strawberries and you're like, oh, the strawberries look fresh. It's not even June. June is strawberry season. These must come from Mexico. It's a little hotter there. These are probably sweet. Let's buy those. You put those in your cart. You walk by the, I live in Houston, the Tortilleria where the, the grandmas are actually making tortillas at the grocery store. It's great living in Houston. Yeah, 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 we got good tortillas there. H-E-B, who knows H-E-B? Who knows what I'm talking about? Some of you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you throw some tortillas in there. You're like, ooh, the low-carb yogurt. By the way, I've lost a ton of weight. Here's my secret. There's a brand of yogurt called Too Good. They don't add any sugar. It's got three grams of carbs, which is really low for uh, yogurt. And whipped cream, holy mackerel. You know, if you're trying to lose weight, eat all the whipped cream you want to. Basically, it's air, <laughs> right? So you take the, the yogurt, right? And you put a whole bunch, like a whole bunch of whipped cream on it. And, uh, and, and then you eat it for dessert. And you're just as happy as if you had a big piece of chocolate cake because you got the good part of the cake anyway, which is the whipped cream, <laughs> right? And, and, and you walk out of the grocery store and you get home and you're like, shit, I forgot to buy my soap. <laughs> Has that ever happened to anybody here? <laughs> right? So you forget your daydreams, and it's not a big, giant mystery to your life. Like, I don't think. I never think. I never have a thought. Right? So, so what happens to us at nighttime isn't really a mystery because it happens to us in the daytime as well. I've become really interested in this idea that there really isn't much difference between our daytime and our nighttime dreaming. By the way, we spend 50% of our waking life daydreaming. Some of you are sitting in this room right now and you're paying attention to every third, fourth, seventh, or twelfth word that I'm saying, but you're thinking about your dog H -E or H-E-B, <laughs> right? Or, or, or whether Opa's really worth 70 bucks or what well, it is, by the way, uh, or, or whatever else you're thinking about, right? And, and this is what our minds do. They say we have 50,000 thoughts a day. These might be an emotion, a fragment, a sentence, a complete thought, but our minds are active. Like a fish swims in water, people are swimming in thoughts. Actually, that's what I used to say. Some of you have heard me say that before. I've changed it. What do you say? Like fish swim in water, people swim in dreams. That's what I say now. Every single one of us, every single day, whether we're aware of it or not. So here's the question. If our minds are doing all of this wandering, can we make it useful? Well, I had a list. I don't know where the damn list is. I guess it's out there. That's okay. It's in my mind. I wrote the list. 
So let's see if I can remember what's on my damn list. Larry Page. Larry Page, creator of Google, he's a student. He's, a, he's, a, he's an undergraduate student, and he's anxious about passing his exams. He's like, oh, if I don't pass my exams, my mother's going to be mad at me. And so he's, ang he's having anxiety. He goes to bed, and he dreams, I could pass my exams if all the hard drives were connected to each other. And I could just suck the information from any one of these hard drives. And he woke up and dropped out of school and invented Google. Yeah. <laughs> I can't pronounce his last name, but Dimitri, I keep wanting to say Medvedev, but that's not it. Anyway, the guy who invented the periodic table of elements, the periodic, you know, the periodic chart of elements, we all studied it in high school, we had to memorize those elements. He was like, I don't know where all these go. I just can't figure it out. I'm a scientist and I'm supposed to know this stuff and I want to invent something really cool, but I can't. And he went to sleep and he dreamt the periodic table of elements, dreamt the whole damn thing, right? The sewing machine. Anyone here ever use a sewing machine before? Ever watch anybody use a sewing machine? So this is a true story. The guy who invented the sewing machine, his name was James somebody, I think. I don't remember his singer. name. It's not, not Singer. It was before him. Some singer probably was like Elon Musk and stole the idea. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but, but he had this dream. He was trying to invent the sewing machine. And he had a dream that he was being held by cannibals until he could do it. So it was like a nightmare. Right? And so he has this nightmare that the cannibals are holding him hostage, and that if he can't invent the sewing machine, he's been working on it, and then he'll figure it out, then, then he was going to be killed by the cannibals and eaten. And he couldn't figure it out, so they threw his spears at him, and the spears had holes in the end. <laughs> and he woke up from his nightmare and was like, holy shit, if you want to make a mechanical device that can actually go up and down, you need a hole in the end of it, not in the top of it, and invented the sewing machine because of his dream. All right, that's some science-y stuff. Let's get to the good stuff. Any John Lennon fans here? Imagine if you could put your dreams to work. One of my favorite songs by John Lennon, number nine, Dream, came to him in a dream. Uh, other creative stuff. Anyone ever watch Mary Shelley's Frankenstein? That's one of her nightmares. She had a dream about this scary creature that was created in a laboratory and electrified. By the way, anyone here like Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator? Pretty good movie, right? Same thing, Terminator came from a dream. Art, science, literature. Our dreams give us the opportunity not only to create, but to actually solve problems. By the way, I'll tell you how to do it. Before the hour's over. Would that be cool? Yes. Okay, good. I was thinking of looking at a couple other things, just some random thoughts that I had. Uh, I wrote these down because with 50,000 thoughts a day, I forget a lot of stuff. <laughs> so people are always looking for the meaning behind the dream. And what I want to assure you is that in dream analysis, the meaning is in the dream. The meaning is not behind the dream. In other words, when you do dream analysis correctly, the dream will tell you what the dream is about. The answer is in the dream. The answer is not behind the dream. That's something really powerful and really important because too many people spend too much time trying to find the hidden meaning. And because they're looking for the hidden meaning, they almost always miss the meaning that's directly in front of their face. Uh, I said the dreams aren't random. I said that ideas come from dreams and the dreams are always in the first, not always, but often in the first perceptual position. But this is a really important thing. Dreams make sense. The reason our dreams don't make sense to us is because of our own limiting beliefs that keep us from seeing the obvious that's right in front of us every single night. Um, the dreams are powerful. Dreams are important. Religion, history, psychology, science, invention. But these dreams, famous dreams like Joseph's, the interpretations of Pharaoh, you know, Joseph's dad, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the guy with the cannibals and the sewing machine, that's all fine and dandy, but you have dreams. And you have dreams every single night. And I want to help you figure out how to analyze your dreams and use hypnosis as a tool to help you. Now, here's the cool thing about this. When you spend some time learning about dream analysis, you can do at least two things. One, you can change your own experience and make your own life better. How many of you would like to accomplish more stuff, have more great ideas, and, uh, and, and feel, feel awesome, right? 
Dream analysis can do some of those things for you. Um, one of the other things dream analysis do in private practice as a hypnotist can actually give you a new product or service. And, and I guarantee you there aren't too many hypnotists out there saying, hey, come to see me and I'll hypnotize you. And, and when I hypnotize you, I'm going to uh, uh, help you explore your dreams so you can find new meaning, new ideas and live a better life as a result of dream analysis and hypnosis is a fantastic tool for that. So, so I think there are a couple of real practical reasons why we should spend some time focusing on dream analysis. And I want to share with you my sort of five, the reason I titled the book Panoramic Dream Analysis is because panoramic vision, you want to be able to see everything. So earlier I went out on this balcony out here and I don't know if you stood out on the balcony, but you get a panoramic view of the convention center, of the pool, of the pool bar, of some of the other buildings, even the airplanes coming in to MCO Airport. Uh, you can see the other Rosen Plaza Hotel that you might have actually gone to on your way over here. Um, and, and, and so you get this panoramic view. It's really pretty out there. Has anyone else ever done that? Or the walkway between here and the convention center. And that panoramic vantage point is an all-encompassing vantage point. It lets you see the big picture. So when we do dream analysis, our goal is to see our dreams in context of the bigger picture, a praxeological approach, from a spiritual approach, from a psychological approach, from our relationships. By the way, relationships are a common subject of dreams. By the way, something else interesting about dreams? We dream more about negative emotions than we do about positive emotions, even if we're positive people. Say that again. We dream more about negative emotions than we do about positive emotions. By the way, something else interesting about dreams, we don't just dream as if it's a movie, a cinematographic thing that's going on in our mind. We actually dream in all of our senses. Do blind people dream? Yes, they dream with a greater level of awareness of their sense of smell, their sense of taste, their sense of hearing, their sense of whatever one I'm missing, because there's five of them. There's actually more than that, but uh, those are the big five that we talk about in second grade. And you do too. At night, you dream and you smell a fart. And no, it wasn't somebody else in the room, it was actually in your dream. In your dream, you taste the donut that you're dreaming about. In your dreams, you actually hear the sound of the doorway closing. All of our senses are active in the dream process. By the way, sometimes people ask me, well, how come whenever I'm like running in a dream, I don't actually run in the bed, right? Or, or how come? The science behind this is kind of interesting. Yeah, he does, but most of us don't, right? When you're getting a boxing match and you're not actually punching the pillow or somebody next to you, this guy is, but, but, but the rest of us aren't. That's because our, our bodies do some amazing stuff during the dreaming process. The amygdala, the old brain, the lizard brain, the emotional part of the brain, it's all going full blast. But the prefrontal cortex, it's basically shut down. And that's the part that controls the ability to actually move, which is why people have sleep paralysis. That's, they're scared of it, but that's actually normal. That's what our bodies are supposed to do so that when we jump off a cliff in a dream, we don't actually jump off the edge of the bed, right? So our bodies, you know, back to Skinner, are, are amazing biological, you know, by the way, in, dream, in sleep cycles, so in hypnosis, we talk about alpha and delta and theta. This is the coolest thing in the world. How many of you wish you could go to the spa? How many of you are like, this conference is cool, but I wish I could go to the spa. I could get like a soap scrub and a massage. I could go in the rain shower. Yep. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. You do that every single night. Every single night. And you're like, what do you mean? You go to the spa every single night. So this is what, as hypnotists, we talk about, you know, the alpha level, the beta level, then we go into theta level, then we go into delta level, and delta is deep sleep. All right, so here's what actually happens in this. So these wave cycles, right, are the rate of a wave length, okay? So what happens when we're in delta level deep sleep is we have long waves, Right? When we're alert, when we're driving down the highway and we're paying attention to traffic, we're in that alpha level, right? And our waves are very small. Um, and, and what happens from a physical perspective, when the waves are very small, we, we, actually, we actually need a lot of blood going through there and other things going through there. These electrical signals are going back and forth. I'm trying to put it in basic language here. But when we're in that deep level of sleep, we actually don't need that blood. So what happens? The blood actually 
doesn't flow through the brain. I mean, it does, but it doesn't flow at the same rate. And what actually comes along is literally brain fluid, spinal fluid that comes in and washes our brains at night. Our brains are literally going to a spot every time we dream. Dreaming is healthy. Right? It's, it's literally your being brainwashed every single night. <laughs> so this is important because what's happening when we're dreaming is dreams are literally the biological process of cleaning out those crappy, difficult emotions that we have to experience being a human being. So my mom told me the other day, my mom's never been interested in any book I've ever written. I got 29 books, and she's been uninterested in all of them. But she said to me the other day, she was at my house this weekend, she said, so you wrote a book on dream analysis. And I said, well, yes, I did. It's $12. <laughs> you can't make money off your friends and family? Who can you make money off of? I gave her a book. Uh, she said, you know, I have a repetitive dream, and it's kind of scary. And I have a dream that your sister, Jill, my sister's name is Jill, she, she, she's, she's in my arms, but I can't feed her. And, and she, has, she, she needs food, but I, I can't give her any food. I don't have any food to give her. And, 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 and I keep ha I've been having this dream now. My sister's like, you know, I mean, I'm 57. She's probably at least 52 or 53. And, and she's like, yeah, I've been having this dream for 50 years. She, she, said, she said, you know, what does this mean? And, and, and I, I didn't have time to do a dream analysis session with her. Your mom? My mom, yeah. So I gave her the book. <laughs> but I said to her, the good news is, every time you have a nightmare, you wake up on the other side of it. The lesson, even from a nightmare, is that it ends. That's a really powerful reframe. How many of you use NLP and you use the fast phobia cure, right? Anyone use the fast phobia cure? And what's the process of the fast phobia cure? Start the client before they have the fearful event, pace them through the fearful event till they get on the other side and the fearful event is concluded, right? And then check to see, tote, test, operate, test, exit, see if the, if, the, if the experience is different now. This is what a nightmare is. A nightmare is a good thing. What a nightmare literally does for a person is it gives them an opportunity to rehearse and practice the shitty stuff that really does happen to us in the real world before we have to face those difficulties, which is why kids have more nightmares than adults. Because kids don't have the same experiences we have. Our dream life is literally giving us the mental experiences to tackle the challenges of the world. And so when I have a nightmare, I wake up and say, I am grateful for my nightmare. That's crazy, Richard. I am grateful for my nightmare because it prepared me to handle the difficulty that's ahead. And every time I have a nightmare, I always wake up, which literally means it was just a dream. And to somebody with PTSD where nightmares are part of the diagnostic features, that's something their psychiatrist never told them. And instantly, instantly, you can see a sense of relief come over them. Our dreams are powerful. They change us. The process I guide people through so that they can have a panoramic vantage point and see their dream experiences from this praxeological perspective is a process I call the heart process. H-E-A-R-T. So you can write some notes down or you can give me 12 bucks. It's in here. <laughs> Uh, either way, right? Uh, and the heart process is this. The first, the H is for, I like acronyms in case you didn't notice. Right? That, I guess that's because I'm trained in ACT therapy. Like the whole thing of ACT therapy is like learn as many acronyms as one human being possibly can and then you're a great therapist. Um, anyone trained in ACT therapy, you'll get that. Um, highlight the who, the what, the when, the how, and the why. Dragnet. How many of you watch Dragnet on TV? Just the facts, right? And that's exactly what this first step is all about. We are recalling, we're highlighting the who, the what, the how, the when, the why, the where. Now, here's the thing. In dream analysis, when I'm writing my dreams down, because I write my dreams down on what I call the heart worksheet, but you can just use a plain piece of paper, it works just the same. Um, 
you want to do this from a first-person perspective. You don't want to say, last night I had a dream about Roberta, who was giving a talk at an event, and along came a spider who sat down beside her and scared Roberta away. You don't want to do you want to say this. You want you want to do this from a first person perspective, and it's a really power, it's a subtle but powerful difference. I am at a convention. I am watching Roberta speak. She is talking about really great stuff, but a spider comes out of the ceiling and sits down next to her. This scares Roberta away. Right? Do you see the difference in how I describe the dream? One is I remember this. One is hypnotists will recognize this. I'm revivifying it. And when I revivify something, I enhance the likelihood of my memory remembering more details. So how do you remember a dream? You start telling your dreams to the people who you share your world with, or at least the pieces of paper you share your office with, or more specifically, the notepad in your bedroom like I have. When we begin to record our dreams, and it doesn't have to be a whole novel. You don't have to like, like, oh, Richard said I have to write down seven pages, right? No, you just need to write down the who, the what, the when, the why, the where. And, and here's the most amazing thing. When you start cataloging your dreams, something amazing happens. Actually, two things are amazing that happens. You start to see how tonight's dream is related to, to tomorrow's dream and how next week's dream was related to yesterday's dream. And you'll start to see that there are panoramic panoramic connections between your dreams. And if you look hard enough and connect with enough people, you'll see that Carl Jung was right. We're all connected to the, we're connected to the collective unconsciousness, and the collective unconsciousness of all mankind is, in fact, reflected in your dreams. That's a kind of a metaphysical experience. But if you do this, you'll get there, and you'll discover that. I woke up this morning, and my dream was right there. Yes, it happens to us. What we should do is we should quiet the mind. We should meditate. We should open ourselves with a with a with a an affirmation that that I have wonderful dreams, or I have dreams I can learn from, and in quiet reflection I can recall my dreams and allow your. And then, if you don't recall a dream after giving yourself some space to recall a dream, it's perfectly okay to have a human experience and say I don't remember all of my dreams. But I still have gratitude for the dreams that I have, even the ones I can't recall. And you'll find that by practicing, practicing this highlight stage, dreams become easier and easier and easier to recall. But you still won't recall all of them. By the way, we're not supposed to recall all of them. We're not supposed to. Right? We don't recall most of the stuff. I mean, some of you can't remember what you think. What did you have for lunch? Some of you are like, oh my God, what did I have for lunch? Some of you are like, oh, dude, I had a hot dog. Really, what do you have for breakfast? Oh, now I stumped you. So we don't really remember most of the stuff that flows through our head most of the time. This is normal. And so you don't have to be harsh on yourself. I was doing an online dream analysis group for the last six weeks with a group of people, and uh, one of the guys came to class, and he said, look, I... I just, I just don't remember my dreams. He was like beating himself up for not remembering his, his dreams. And I said, kind of paradoxical attention, stop trying to remember your dreams, just do. Right? And he was like, oh my gosh, freedom. And then he had dreams like every week he brought to class. It was awesome. So what's the E? H-E-A-R-T. We want to look at the emotional content of dreams. We want to look at two things when we have dreams. We want to look at what was the emotion I was experiencing in the dream. Because remember, the you in the dream is actually the real you. It's not, it's not about you. It is you. What was your emotion in that dream? That's your emotion. You own it. We're human beings, not human doings. It's okay to have difficult emotions. That line, by the way, people think it's from South Park. It's actually from John Bradshaw. Mm -hmm. South Park lifted it from John Bradshaw, <laughs> who wrote some really great stuff. But the second aspect of emotional content is, what's my emotion in reflection of the dream? Now that I'm recalling my dream, what emotions do I feel? And you'll notice often the dream emotion and the emotion after the dream are entirely different emotional experiences. And unless we actually take the time to pay attention to our dreams, we miss that. And we don't know, we don't get the opportunity to integrate those things. So 
So what's the A? This is the fun one, at least if you studied any Carl Jung. Anyone here ever read any Carl Jung's book or study Carl Jung, right? The Shadow Self, all kinds of stuff. Archetypes, images, and symbols. So I want to look at my dream and I want to say I dreamed about Roberta giving a talk at a workshop and a spider camera sat down beside her. And uh, what's the symbol here? The sy in my dream, that spider looked exactly like the one from Charlotte's Web. Remember Charlotte's Web had a spider? Remember? And I came and talked to the pig. Remember that? Right? Right? Yep. yep. So, so, it, so the symbol was Charlotte's Web spider. The symbol is the nursery rhyme. Right? I, I, in my dream, it wasn't a nursery rhyme, but clearly in retrospect, the, the, the imagery and the symbolism is of the nursery rhyme from Little Miss Muffet. And, and, uh, and, and, and by the way, that's always been one of my favorite therapy stories. Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider, sat down beside her, and scared Miss Muffet away. The spider wasn't doing anything. <laughs> didn't bother her, didn't threaten her, right? That fear response is really powerful. If I have this kind of dream, I might even ask myself, Am I fearful of Roberta? I am I, am I, you right, exactly. Am I, you know, am I afraid of conferences? Yes. Uh, I'm really good at sleep, but you get a lot of sleepless nights when you put this stuff together, right? Uh, and, and, and so, so I, I can, when I look at the imagery, when I look at the symbols that occur in my dream, then I get the opportunity to understand what my dream is all about. And archetypes are so rich. Um, and archetypes come in all kinds, you know, think of archetypes in terms of the hero's journey, right? You know, we have the hero, we have the wanderer, we have the journey, we have the, the, you know, I mean, all these different types of things. But we have archetypal events, marriage, death, travel, starting a job, retirement, right? These are all archetypal events. Um, we have, we have other archetypal themes that, 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 that we experience at times, you know, uh, leaving home, I mean, all, all these ki kind of things, uh, uh, you know, death of a loved one, uh, discovering love, uh, all of these things that are really rich archetypal content that we can, we can, we, we can analyze. And here's the good news. You don't have to have a dream tonight and take the heart worksheet and try to figure it all out tonight. All you have to do is write a couple of points tonight, a couple of points tomorrow when you have another dream, a couple of points the next day when you have another dream. Keep doing this. Do this for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, you will start to have a rich connection and see the depth of your dreams. But more importantly than that, the solutions that your dreams offer you for offer to you. So there's our H-E-A, what's our R, right? Our R is our reframing or our rehearsal. So the R could be either one of those things. I mean, I guess, you know, it could be the hard process, right? Because both of those things are valid. But sometimes I have a dream that leaves me in, on, like my mom, I was my mom was, the reason I didn't do a dream analysis session with my mom is because we had to go to, I had to take her to the airport. She was leaving. Right? She waited to spring this interest in dream analysis until an hour before her flight. And I live in Houston, which means we got to fight Houston traffic. And, and, right, right, right. So I was like, you know, I can't really have a serious conversation in the car with her, not in Houston traffic. And so, you know, it's a real city. And so, uh, you know, 70 miles an hour, bumper to bumper, and one person screws it up, and you're all toast. Um, so so, so I, I tried to reframe it. Right, that, that the dream you have actually has value, and the good news is that it's over. In other words, your daughter is safe. You've been able to meet your daughter's needs. You don't have to worry that, that, that you're a bad mom because you woke up, right? That she had never thought about it that way before. So I reframed it for her. She was relieved by it. By the way, my mom's never read one of my books. So she had to fly from Houston to Austin, Austin to Tulsa. So she called me from Austin. She's like, that flight was only 38 minutes, but I got through the first three chapters. I said, what do you think? Right? And she said, I don't know. Let me read the rest on the way to Tulsa, which she did. <laughs> so, um, so this process is so simple, even Richard's mother can do it. <laughs> so, so we can reframe our dreams. I, I can have a dream, and I can realize that, uh, that 
you know, the meaning, by the way, the meaning I attach to it, this is why dream dictionaries are like, oh, if you dream of a purple cow, that means this, those are crap, right? So in Chinese culture, there's a book called, the, there's a book written by the Duke of Zhao, right? And it's like every Chinese person knows about the Duke of Zhao. It's like 60-year-old dream analysis book. And it's like, uh, you know, if you dream of a, of, of a, of a yellow you know, cord, that means you're going to have money. And, you know, if you dream of a, a flowery shawl, it means you're going to have a prosperous spring, right? So these are all dream analysis books that purport to tell you, here's what the dream means, and here's what's going to happen because of the dream. But guess what? The author of that book wasn't creating your dream. You are the only one who can tell what the, what, the, what the dream means. When I do dream analysis work, I am not imposing my suggestions on them. In fact, I'm very Rogerian when they say to me, I think the purple cow means this. With all of the effort I have to sound like I actually have a master's degree in psychotherapy, I say, uh-huh. <laughs> because uh-huh encourages them to then continue their thought. Right? So there's, there's actually a reason why that therapist goes, uh-huh, or so you said you thought the way that you thought when you thought the thinking that you thought. Um, those reflections back cause a person to think more, and, and they can attach what needs to be reframed. But sometimes our dreams give us an opportunity to rehearse, to rehearse a new outcome, to create a new ending. So anyone here work with PTSD, uh, uh, imagery rehearsal technique, IRT is an evidence-based protocol that comes from cognitive behavioral therapy that's used in the VA and elsewhere, blah, 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 blah. Fancy name, lots of science behind it, it's dream analysis. We can go back to, you know, they got all these fancy names, it's dream analysis, imagery replacement therapy. The person with PTSD, they have this dream that, I don't know, let's say it's PTSD from a car wreck and the truck keeps hitting them over and over and over and over again, right? One of those kind of dreams, right? They were in a truck accident, maybe bad things happened, got run over by a truck. So their dream is they're getting hit by trucks from every direction over and over and over again. This is their dream, right? And the imagery rehearsal technique asks them to create a new ending for their dream. Some people are like, well, how can you do that? Because the dream was what the dream was. How can you create a new dream? Guess what? Your daytime creativity is just an extension of your dream. Because there's no difference between your daydreams and your night dreams. And even if you're awake, you can still dream and you can continue the same dream and you can do it consciously, which we call lucid dreaming when it happens at night. And so none of the stuff is really remarkable but we don't use these skills. And we can literally encourage a client to create a new alternative ending and then rehearse it. The trucks, when they hit, they bounce. I'm rubber, you're glue, bounced off me and stuck to you. I can practice that in a dream. That's amazing because we are infinitely creative. So the reframing process or the rehearsal process can be powerful techniques that we can use in our own life or techniques that we can actually share with our clients. And what's the T? Trust. Transfer and tote. One of the things I think is important in dream analysis is to trust your higher self, your higher consciousness, your best self. This is the philosophy of Milton Erickson. Milton Erickson believed that we had within us all the resources to solve any problem. That's Milton Erickson 101. Yet I meet a whole lot of hypnotists that are skeptical of their client being able to access the resources and think they need to give them something awesome from the house. Let me, give you, let me tell you what your dream means. That's meaningless to the dreamer. But if we can help them to trust. I say this about dreaming though. What you think the dream means is what the dream means. What you think the dream means is what the dream means. And so we, we can trust this process and the more we do it, the more we get in the habit of doing that, the easier it is to trust. And nobody knows better for me than me. Not even my mother. <laughs> So there's our, our trust. We spend all day we try to do a whole workshop on the trusting self. I mean, that's what John Bradshaw was all about, like the inner child, trust yourself, and you know, 
uh, you know, break these toxic ties from these people who are trying to impose their belief on you. Uh, trust yourself. Move to a point in personal development and self-growth that you've practiced trusting yourself. So we trust ourselves. And then we transfer these things. The goal of dream analysis, yeah, dream analysis is interesting, but ultimately it's to invent the sewing machine or make billions of dollars running Google or to write a great song to play on the radio. No, by the way, I'll, everybody go home and play Number Nine Dream by John Lennon. It's actually a pretty cool song. And of course, Yoko's in it, so it's weird. And uh, that makes it even better. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was some. That was fun. Oh, yeah, I kept posting that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so but we, want, we want to transfer our dreams into the real world. Why do we want to do that? Because our dreams have value. Our dreams are important. Our dreams serve a biological process. Everybody does it. We've been doing it every day. It's happened since the beginning of time, and we've been curious since recorded history. And so rather than simply saying, well, that was an interesting talk, start to practice it. And what you'll discover is that you can transfer this knowledge, this experience, these truths into your real world, and your real world becomes better. By the way, sometimes it's simple things. I had a dream one day, and this some, we dream often based on our real experiences, right? I mean, dreams aren't really random. So I had a dream that my office was like all chaos, right? And I couldn't get my papers and the computer wouldn't start. I walked up to my office the next morning. I was like, well, this place is a mess. I should clean my office. So the action I took was I cleaned my office. I organized all of my books. I put the papers that I wasn't ever going to look at again in the trash can. Right? So, and my office has been a pretty cool place to hang out for the last couple of months because it's clean now. And I'm, I'm a notorious pack rat who doesn't actually clean the office. And so, so, so we can find little things that enhance our life or we could find something really, really big like the periodic table. Of, oh, by the way, DNA. The helix of DNA, that came in the development of DNA in a, in, in a dream. I can't remember that guy's name. We were in the 1950s. What's his name? Watson. Yeah, Watson. That's right. So he literally dreamed the entire... Con so like all these TV shows were like, oh, you better wear gloves because they're going to get your DNA. You know, if, you, if you want to commit the crime, you know now you got to like make sure you don't drop a hair. you got to shave your head bald before you kill anybody because they're going to get you from the DNA. That came from a dream, right? So, so amazing things can happen. And then, of course, NLP gives us a real valuable process. NLP process is test it, operate it, see if it works. Test it again. If it still works, exit. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. Yes? Oh, that's the two-minute warning? Thank you very much. Yeah. I get the two-minute warning, too. They're going to kick me off the stage. But that's the heart process, and it's pretty cool. You have notes because you wrote them. You have the replay, or you can spend 12 bucks and you can buy the book. It's all front. But I think dreams are awesome, and hypnosis is a valuable tool in every step along the way for gratitude for our dreams, for enhancing recall of our dreams, for eliciting dreams. By the way, one of the things I do with people who have nightmares is teach them how to go to sleep, creating thoughts that become dreams that are peaceful and pleasant and reassuring. To manage difficult emotions with hypnotic processes. And hypnosis and dream analysis go together like bama lama lama ka ding a da ding a dong And I would love to hear more hypnotists talking about dream analysis at all the conferences I go to over the next couple of years because as experts in sleep, <laughs> we should be experts in dreams because that's what's happening when we're asleep. And it's happening in your hypnosis sessions as well. All right, I'm out of time, but I wrote a book. You can buy it. The Hypnosis Club is awesome. If you were in season number one, a series of eight uh, workshops, season number two is coming up with another series of eight workshops. And you won't want to miss these. These are all online, three hours on Saturdays. Uh, they're all recorded and replayed, so if you ever miss one or miss them all, you still have access 24-7 to all the replays. And if you're interested in that opportunity that's coming up, just stop by my table at the front and uh, pick up a book or uh, join the Hypnosis Club season number two that's coming up. 
But most of all, I hope you guys have a wonderful conference. And I really appreciate you coming to the ICBCH conference. Uh, my goal has always been to, uh, uh, to create a good learning experience where we can learn the things that we can really use with our clients at 4.15 when we get home. And I hope that this conference accomplishes that for everybody. I'm one minute over time. Thank you very much, though. It's been a great day.